Thanks, Scott. The idea for this class came last fall to me. Christian came into, into our office and sat down and said, hey, I've got a client. He's looking at a four unit property up by City Park. Um, can you take a look and let's decide what this is worth? He showed, showed me the MLS page and we started scratching on paper where, where the rents were. We didn't really know the expenses. We did our best to uh, estimate what they were gonna be. Um, I asked a few questions about the condition of the property. We didn't know, we hadn't toured it yet. Um, and as Christian and I, we spent about an hour together kind of talking through it, decided um, that there was not a single number that you could pick on what that property was worth. It was gonna be uh, dependent on, uh, in a lot of ways, who bought it, what their plans for the property was gonna be. It was worth something as is, but we could tell from how low the rents were that as is price was not the highest uh, best use of that property wasn't going to be the highest value. We started asking what was his client's appetite for improving the property, renovating it. Was there extra money available to try to get the rents up? Um, we wanted to look at what else was happening in that sub market around North City Park, all to get at it. And as, as we finished the hour and, and uh, came up with kind of five different scenarios on what the property could be worth, how it could be used, what the future of it could be. Um, I went in later that afternoon and talked to Justin and said, Justin, Christian, I just had the greatest conversation. I go, it was just a simple review on a four unit building, but it came for both of us. It brought up so many different issues. I said, I'd love to have that conversation with everybody um, if I could. And he said, well, actually, Greg, you can put you on the, on the schedule and see you in the spring. And so here we are today. Christian, thank you really all because of the, that conversation you and I had. So as we jump in today, we're gonna to talk about um, how we value properties and what we use to, uh, to look. And it, terms that, that you've heard, you know, what's the cash flow, what are the rents, what, what's the cap rate, the net operating income of the property. Can it be renovated? All of that I want to skim over today, but most importantly is take questions that, that you guys have. So as feel free to stop me at, um, if uh, I'm going too fast, or if there's something you want to dive uh, deeper into, and then certainly follow up today. Um, stop by the Wash Park office, call either Kyle or myself anytime. We're happy to talk about this. Um, you've heard it say the beauty's in the eye of the, of the beholder, and with multifamily um, that is so true. As I mentioned, one of the things Christian and I talked about was, well, who is looking at this and what's their plan for it? Uh, different people will value properties differently. And so um, the idea what we want to do is help you today to know a good property when you see one. Um, and remember, depending on which client you're working with or um, who the investor or the prospect may be, they're going to see um, any given property a little bit differently. But typical investors, there really is no such thing. Um, they don't all throw money around uh, crazily. But when we look at investors, when we look at our client list, we've got business owners, retirees, working professionals, really anybody willing to save and then invest their money is likely to come to you and say they're looking for income property to invest in. Um, uh, why do they do it? Primarily for investment return. They're looking to make money. Uh, but other reasons for some, they want the tax deductions that come with owning properties. It could be multifamily, it could be single unit, attached or detached properties that they come for you uh, looking for. Another reason people buy investment property is because they sold investment property. 1031 exchanges, they're looking to defer the capital gains tax on what they just sold by buying something else. Um, and then some people just do it simply to have something to do. Um, and we've had clients that, have, that do that. I have a, a client uh, currently, Kyle and I, he owns a multi-hundred unit portfolio of properties. He called us up last week and said, guys, I, I'm bored, I need something to do. I'll buy anything, I'll buy a 12 unit, just give me a project. So you get the, you get the full spectrum, especially in this, in this market. 
Uh, what do they do with their property? What's their plan? Some is to run it as is. They want to buy something that's stabilized, continue it. Others want to fix and flip it. They're looking for a short-term uh, gain by improving the property. Or they want to renovate it and hold it long-term. One of the keys is you're talking to your clients about what their plans are. If they're looking to fix or flip, if they're looking to renovate, is to make sure they have the additional capital to see that project all the way through. And that was something Chris and I spoke about that day. Last thing you want to do is start a project, demo out three of the units, and you can't finish the fourth one. And now you've got a property that's neither as is or completely fixed up. So make sure they're ready to go all the way. Um, and then we really screen, as, as you would with buyers, screen for their motivation. We want to make sure if they come to us saying that they want to buy, that they really are ready, willing, and able to see a project all the way through. Um, do they have um, the available money? Certainly that's an easy question. Um, are they ready to do it? But then to ask them, what's their outlook on the future? What's their risk tolerance? What other alternatives are they looking for? Because it's frustrating to go out with someone who says, I'd love to buy income property, I'd help me then find a duplex. And a little bit later, they've decided, oh, you know what? I'm just going to put it back into my 401k or I sent it to my stockbroker or I'm just stuffing it under the pillow for a while. Um, what makes a building attractive? Again, it's a beauty in the eye of the beholder, but some of the things that we look um, and ask our clients for um, is are they looking at a property short term or long term? Uh, some will say, I, I need immediate cash flow. I've got money to invest, but the kids are going to college in two years, so I need to turn this money into a monthly check immediately versus someone who may say, I'm planning for retirement 10 or 15 years from now. I don't need immediate cash back. I want to invest and uh, reinvest in the property for that long-term income growth, but also build up that long-term appreciation in the property. But regardless of short or long-term, we always remember kind of what the goal is, and that's to make money. So we want to, we want to stay focused. Um, on that. Today, I don't have all the details of that property Christian and I spoke about, so we picked another four unit property. Uh, this is 1848 South Pearl. For those of you, it's about um, three blocks down the street from Sushi Den. It's in the Platte Park neighborhood. And this was something that we listed, marketed, and sold last August. Um, so I want to run you through this example today. Um, the slides that, that are getting passed around right now, we'll get to those in about six slides when we get into the actual financial breakdown on this property. Um, the slides will catch up to the handouts we gave you. Factors when you look at an investment. Uh, questions Christian and I went over that day. What's the size of the property? Not only how many units are there, but what are they? Are they studio units? Are they two bedroom units? Are they relatively small? We've seen studios as small as 220 square feet, a listing we had on Capitol Hill uh, earlier this year, or are they large 900 square foot two bedrooms? Size of the property certainly is a big factor. Location, uh, the income, current income and income potential, the expenses of the property, the condition, and then sales comps, of course. What else are you seeing in the neighborhood? What else is in the market that's gonna help us figure out um, what a property's worth. So we met with the family that owned this property. Um, they asked us the immediate question, you know, hey, what do you guys think you can get for it? What is this property worth in the market? So we ran through it with them. The size of the property, it was four one bedroom, one bath units. They were 600 square feet each. The location was fantastic on South Pearl in that Platte Park neighborhood. It was a half a block up the street from the original Park Burger across from uh, Flat Park Brewery, it just on a cute block, it was terrific. The income of the property, about $800 rents on those in place, it was fully leased. Um, the expenses on the property were good. Um, it was owner managed, uh, which certainly keeps some expenses down in terms of management and leasing expenses. 
The other thing this property had, it was individually metered each of the four units, which we don't always see. So the tenants were paying their own uh, gas and electric bills, which, which kept the overall operating expenses for the owner way down. The condition of the property, it was neat and tidy. Um, no major work needed. The landscaping was, was pretty good. Um, curb appeal was nice. And then we looked at the sales comps in the neighborhood. And when we do that, we're looking at price per unit, um, dollar per square foot, and then the, uh, the cap rate. And cap rate is something that um, if you're not used to doing income property is kind of newer. So we're gonna kind of dive into what that's all about here. Uh, in just a minute. The uh, last thing that we want to sit and talk with clients about is what their belief is in where the market's headed. You can show them a terrific, great property um, that is currently cash flow and looks good, but if they don't believe the market is sustainable, if they think we're headed for the cliff, they're not going to buy. And if we feel the market's headed for a cliff or some softening, it's something we certainly want to communicate to the investors so that we're matching up um, expectations for them uh, and all. And so at the, at the very end, you, get, you, you come right back to where you start. And the question is, is this investment, is this property gonna make money for our client in the short and long term? So this is where I want to kind of jump into the financial analysis that we do. And this is where the handouts we can kind of pick up on this next slide. So you've um, got those, and again, as we do this part now, please feel free to ask any questions um, as they come up. So I started to say earlier, how do we decide what a building's worth? We look at the cap rate, the gross rent multiplier, it's um, you know, how strong are the, are the rents in place. Uh, sales comps, certainly, much as you do with any real estate investment, um, price per door, price per unit, uh, dollar per square foot. All of these are easy metrics that, that can be gathered, you can gather um, on MLS and some other uh, services that we subscribe to. So if you've got a multifamily deal you're looking at, um, duplexes are tough for us to get any more information than, than you all would gather. But if you're looking at something four units or larger, feel free to contact us because we can find additional sales comps beyond what you'd see in RE Colorado, for example. Uh, when we look at a property now and get, get started, it's, uh, it's a money in, money out uh, equation that you're looking for. Hopefully this investment property is gonna bring in more monthly income then you're shelling out in ownership expenses. And, and on the income side, you know, we think about rent and parking, um, parking that you wouldn't necessarily see in a duplex that you're gonna charge extra for parking, but if you're in a four, five, 20 unit multifamily, the scarcity of parking, um, if you have some off street available, of course you charge extra to the tenants who, who are able to get that. It's a great source of income. Uh, some of these buildings will have a laundry room, coin-op machines down in the basement, uh, wherever additional source of, of revenue. And then some, a lot of owners are charging back utilities uh, to tenants that uh, if they're not already separately metered. On the expense side, taxes and insurance certainly, um, maintenance, but also the utilities. What are the, what are the water bills and the, and the Excel bills likely to be? Um, if the building's over seven units in Denver, you have to have your own trash uh, service separate from city service. So that, that becomes an expense that kicks in on, on the slightly larger properties. And then of course, mortgage uh, payments. Uh, if, you're, if your client's buying a loan, you're, you're adding all that up and you're looking to, to balance it. And clients will say, well, I'm trying to decide if the numbers work. And that is usually such an open-ended statement. It seems it would be so easy. Add it up, the income, subtract out the expenses, but what does that mean to them? What was their hope? And some, we have clients, uh, actually we don't have clients, we have people contact us that don't 
become our clients, that have very you know, unrealistic expectations on what type of return they're hoping to get on a multifamily uh, property. The market is so tight and has been now for four plus years. The prices have been uh, elevated to a point where these, these don't cash flow eight and 10 and 15% annual returns like someone who may have owned something 10 years ago uh, was able to find. The uh, measure that we use a lot is net operating income. It's, it's that total rental income minus your operating expenses that we just ran through. But the one thing we don't include is the mortgage expense. And it's not to say, don't worry about what your mortgage ex expense is gonna be, but as we compare properties, uh, and this is a building block as we get to that cap rate uh, measuring stick. As we look at properties, uh, the easiest thing to do across properties and across clients is to evaluate them as if they were purchased with cash. And so take that mortgage piece just out of the, out of the analysis for now. And when you have your total rental income and your operating expenses, so it is taxes, it is insurance, it's, it's maintenance, it's leasing and management, but it's not your mortgage expense. That is, is what we call net operating income. So this is where you know, you're gonna see it's the exact same list that we had before minus uh, that mortgage expense. So as I said, net operating income is your building block to your cap rate uh, calculation. And so what is a cap rate? It's the, it's the proportion of the cash flow relative to the price. And what that, what that looks like, your cap rate is your net operating income divided by your price, which can be, once you find uh, your net operating income, whether you work forward or backwards, your cap rate um, to determine what your price is or you're using your price to determine what the cap rate's gonna be. The idea of the cap rate is what is the return you're hoping to get for the investment that's made? And the reason I was saying earlier we take the loan out of the equation is it's not what's your down payment, it's, it's the value, it's the price of the property that you're looking at. And so what you're doing is you're saying, um, how much annual income am I going to get from this investment? What am I going to pay for it? And if I divide those out, I get my cap rate. It's very much uh, similar to interest rates on a savings account that you would have. Um, if you put $10,000 uh, into, into the bank and you're going to get back um, these days 100 bucks at the end of the year, you take the $100 income you got from your savings account, you divide it by the $10,000 you put in, and you're disappointed to find out you got 1% uh, return on your money that year. That would be a 1% cap rate uh, calculation. It's, it's that simple. What am I gonna get at the end of the year, and what was the price I paid for the property? Divide it out, that's your cap rate, or your percent return on an all cash investment. Does that kind of track? Um, the, uh, so let's go, let's go back to our example and, and talk about how we looked at this, at this property. The rents were $800 a month. They, they had three parking spots in a garage out back for which they got a total of $100 a month in, in parking. And so $800 times four apartments was $3,200 plus $100. There were $3,300 of income a month for the year. Your top line income on that property was $39,600. Then we went through the expenses, property tax, insurance, property insurance, the utilities that were paid, even though the tenants had their own electric and gas meters, there was still common utilities to the property, outside lights, uh, 
electricity in the garage, et cetera, was running about $85 a month. Uh, and then there were some repairs and maintenance. Again, on this property being self-managed, there was not a management fee, there were not leasing fees in the current view of it. But they totaled $8,000 in annual expenses, and so we subtract those from one another, and the, the net operating income, the cash flow, was $31,600 um, on the property. And so the question is, if you know a property is going to generate $31,600 a year, or when I say you know, you hope, you expect, the uh, question is, what would you pay for that property um, to get it? What's, what's the price that, that you're going to? And to figure out the price, when you know what the property is going to generate, the missing piece is your cap rate. And uh, so your clients, your, your investors need to tell you what is their required return. Yeah, I, I referenced it similar to a savings account. They could put, they could take their money and go stick it in the bank and get a one percent return. And if they're going to buy, if they're going to take the risk to buy real estate, they're probably going to look for something greater than a one percent return. Um, I mentioned some some folks dream that they can get a ten percent return on their money. Good luck, you're not going to find that. And so between 1% on the low end and 10% on the high end, what is reasonable? What are they looking for? And in this market, as we know, it's not what the buyer wants, it's what the seller's gonna get that's gonna equate to, to where the price falls out. And what we see right now is about 5% is the market return. Or for our investment properties, that's your market cap rate right now, is, is about 5% or what we would call a five cap market. But on this property, if, if you look at $31,000 that it was gonna make, if you had a client that was happy to double the money that they would have in the bank and say, I'd be happy with a 2% return, they're gonna go and lay down almost a million six for this four unit property to get that 2% return. And they'll say, I'm, I'm doing so much better, I'm doing twice as good as I could have done had I just left it in the bank and they would be overpaying for the property. Um, if they were unrealistic in their expectation and thought they wanted an 8% return, they're only going to offer, and again, it's your, it's your NOI divided by your cap rate gives you the price. They're only going to, they, they won't even pay $400,000 for this property. They're never going to sniff a contract. Um, if they're out with that kind of an expectation. But at a 5% return, if they were willing to do that, and again, that's kind of the market rate, they would look at this property and say, you know, about 632, let's offer somewhere 6, 625 and let's see what happens. Again, this was a real property we took to market. Um, you know, as I mentioned back in August, we didn't have 200 uh, tours, Todd. We didn't have 31 offers, but we did in one afternoon. We had 14 tours, uh, and we had five uh, offers generated that day on this little four unit. And the offers came in uh, between 725 and 775. And the question is, well, how does that work? You know, if, if, if the numbers tell you the property is only worth 632, where did these offers come from? And, it, and the whole thing was investors believed the rents on the property were too low. They were below market. Very nice investor, is a mother-daughter team that owned this property. They loved their tenants. And they loved their tenants so much, they kept their rents low. And, and they told us, our, Nobody moves out of our building. We said, well, at $800 rents in Platte Park, they probably never will move out of your building. I'm not surprised. It's not you, it's your rents. But we didn't tell them that. But when investors looked at the property and they said, boy, this is easy. 
950 rents in these one bedrooms. And, it, and you run through the exact same math, but now your annual income increases to 46,800 from where it was at 39 and change. The expenses, nothing changed there. They don't believe it's still the same property. Most of our investors, when I say nothing changes, at this four unit size, I think all of these folks that were offering were planning to manage it themselves. So there wasn't gonna be a big shift in the expense structure. They continue to operate it as is. And so you subtract it, your NOI increased to 38,800, and now the question is, if I can get that kind of cash flow out of the property, um, what would I do, what would I pay for that, you know, additional $7,000 a year that's being created through these higher rents? So again, it's the cap rate equation. I've got an NOI of 38,800. All, almost all these investors were just in their heads thinking it's a five cap market, it's a 5% return. And when you do that math to go to a price there's your 776. And that can totally explains this list of offers now that we received, and you see where they were coming at. And what ended up happening on that property, the tours were on Thursday, all these offers we had by Friday. And over the weekend, uh, they were calling us, three of the, the offers came from clients of ours, two of them through outside brokers. Um, our clients were calling us asking, hey, what happened? There were a lot of people there. What's, what's next? Um, and we said, well, we received, you know, so far, five offers. Oh, good, well, mine was all cash. Yes, yeah, so were the other two that came from clients of ours. And that was kind of all we said, is we received offers. Our list price, by the way, was uh, 745. We told our clients we received <coughs> three cash offers including yours, at or above list price. Let us know by Monday what you want to do. The owners have them all. They're not going to make any decisions. Two of our clients increased uh, their offers on Sunday, um, and we ended up going under contract and closing the deal without any inspection issues at 800000 So that's, that's where that uh, ended up. We decided after the fact, we were trying to figure out, you know, kind of what was the secret to our success other than having a cute building and a great location, is for our clients that toured, and there were nine of them, we sent them with a gift card across the street to Flat Park Brewery <laughs> and said, here's some money, why don't you go across the street and think about it? And they had the doors rolled up, they sat there, had a beer, and just stared at the property for 45 <laughs> minutes, and it worked out. So that was fun. Was it common? It was a cash deal. What if someone made you an offer for 825 with a loan with 30% down? What would you have done then? Huh. They probably, those sellers, yeah. uh, would have would have strongly considered that because they were looking for top dollar. Yeah. Um, at 30% down, we wouldn't have much of a concern about the appraisal. Yeah. Um, it's amazing. Uh, Kind of the appraiser, the pool of appraisers that we work with right now are very deal friendly. If you give them a contract, they're going to appraise it really close. I mean, you'd, you'd have to be way out of bounds uh, to not have an appraisal come in right now, or certainly over the last four years. There's a little bit, there's there's a little bit of a concern for some folks, a big concern where multifamily's headed because of the level of construction that's happening um, this winter. For the first time in several years, we saw a real flattening of rents. Some felt that, dismissed it that, well, it's winter, you've got low leasing traffic, it's not surprising that rents you know, aren't jumping by leaps and bounds, they tend not to over the winter. And that's a 20 year truth that for the last three years we've broken. Rents have grown over the winter months. They did not this year, kind of back to normal. Um, some of that back to normal may be a flattening of, of rent growth going forward. And we'll see what, what happens there. A lot of folks, our team included, are watching kind of month to month and having conversations weekly with some of the bigger management companies in Central Denver and some of our larger portfolio owner clients and saying, what's your leasing traffic like? Are you starting to, to move rents again? And they are having a little bit of a spring bump 
but nothing like <laughs> what, we, what we saw in 2013, 2014, 2015. So, jury's out on that. Is that overall including like apartments as well, like big apartment complexes? It's mostly driven by the bigger apartment complexes. So, the construction that we're seeing right now, and there's there's 19,000 apartment units under construction online. Like they've broken dirt, they've they're coming out of the ground. Um, larger 200, 300, 600 unit properties um, that are being done, and that's what's driving the oversupply are those bigger properties. And you think that's why it's a little bit flatter this year? Definitely. Rental rates because yeah, you've got a lot of supply numbers, yeah. and cha a lot of supply, a lot of empty apartments chasing the handful of tenants who are looking to move in February and in March. Zach, how are you determining your rental rates? Um, what sources do you use? <coughs> you've got a client and they say, what do you think I can rent this place for? What, what do you use? We, there's kind of two sources, one being in the market, oh, yeah. and one if you're looking from outside the market. Um, for our team, and we're, we're in the market, so when we go and look at apartments, chances are we're comparing them to other properties we currently have listed, properties that we sold three years ago that we've just been talking to our clients about, asking them what are they getting today in those units. You know, there's a real familiarity, and then we have a network of management companies and portfolio owners that we talk to regular and kind of get a sense of where rents are. If well, you're looking you outside um, of the market to try to determine uh, rents, which we do, if we're going out into West Lakewood or we're down in South Littleton, we don't know those rents like we do Central Denver. And we don't know the buildings like we do Central Denver. And so a lot of times, um, if we have a prop, a specific property picked, we'll walk the immediate neighborhood and ask neighbors where their rents are. Um, we'll go on Craigslist and put in a zip code and look at, at what kind of um, properties are released, which is so much easier today than it was eight years ago, because now you can see pictures, you, you get an idea of condition, you get a real sense of what's there. Zillow, on the rental side, is, made huge gains really in the last 12 months we did that was far from my mind um, last spring to look on Zillow for rental rates um, today we do that particularly for more specialty um, properties, things that, that we're not familiar with so that's another another source Craigslist to see what's posted sorry There, it's, that's yeah, part clients, of their growth. clients will say, well, that's what's currently for rent. We don't know they actually got that for the rent. You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, well, in this market, they're probably getting darn too close. Well, probably, but the easy place to check is what are the neighbors doing? So sure, if you have a, a uh, triplex or a little six unit building and they tell you, uh, Oh yeah, my rents are all eight fifty a month, but on my vacant unit, I'm asking ten seventy five because that's the market today, and they're trying to get you to redo your math at ten seventy five rents. The question is, are they really? If right. if they are, how come your right. unit's still vacant? And so we, on a smaller property like that, we'd go look at neighboring properties and find out what are they actually getting on their most recent leases and get a sense directionally where that market's headed. Any other questions? Let's bring Michael up. Oh, sorry. Hi. Um, where, <laughs> hi. Hypothetically, you have a building, my building, for instance. Okay. There's a lot of inspection items that might come up. How are those handled with home units? Like, with a typical buyer and seller. Is it the same as for commercial, <coughs> like a house, or? Sure. Um, inspection, yeah, getting through. So you've agreed to a price, you've got a contract price, and, and now here comes the inspector. What What's gonna happen? Uh, a lot of it has to do with the buyer and the inspector that they hire. And so when we're 
sifting through offers, when we were sifting through these offers with the owners of the property, that was one of the questions that they had. I mean, Todd, like you said, what's their financing structure? How are they, how are they gonna pay for this, cash versus a loan? How big's the down payment? Once you get through that set of questions, the next is, well, how likely are they to be, you know, really picky on inspection or not for, for my property? Even something that looks nice, it still had, it was built uh, in the 1950s. It had an older electrical system. So, so we look at things like that and try to profile the buyer. Um, the three cash offers we had, that's pretty easy. You know, they're on a pretty level playing field. All three buyers owned over 50 units of Central Denver properties already. And so we know they're pretty, you know, little things aren't gonna get them excited. And so this decision really came down to price, but inspection can be something. And what we're finding um, on the multifamily side, much like you're seeing in a uh, single unit, is sellers aren't really wanting to hear what your inspection problems are. It, unless the roof is suddenly missing, they, they don't really want to talk about it. And so we're seeing a lot. We've done a number of transactions. Kyle's in an inspection this morning on a 110 year old building in Uptown. We don't expect this buyer to come to us with any issues and, and we don't think the seller wants to hear them. So when you're educating a buyer from And certainly up to, you want to find out how much funds do they have for those things to come up. I mean, if they say, boy, I'm tight, tight, tight down to my last, you know, $50, I hope we don't have any inspection issues, that probably isn't going to fly. But it's typical that um, they would go into a private and go, oh boy, you know, the kitchen appliances are a little bit old. I think I want to replace them. The standard seller response is, well, Go ahead and buy new appliances and you're gonna increase the rents as soon as you get new appliances in here and that's all on you. You know, that, that's part of your investment plan. That's not an inspection issue for, for me as a seller. Um, the things that typically do get negotiated are the unforeseen, the broken sewer, broke and cracked sewer pipes and we get videos and pictures and we argue how cracked is it, how broken is it, how much water actually did back up into the basement, you know, type of conversations if you're gonna tackle even something like that. Anything else? Michael. Thank you.